Happy Mother's Day to all of you amazing moms out there that do the impossible every single day. We're happy that you're tuned in. Please like and share and comment so that we know that you're there. We're going to start off with some worship. Over the mountains and the sea 
happy Mother's Day. Uh, we're so glad you're tuning in with us today. We want to say a special thank you to all the mothers uh, out there. And I um, want to welcome your Sister Valley Church. I'm Pastor Clint. We're so excited that you're tuning in with us today. Uh, we are a church uh, that is passionate about reaching uh, unchurched people. And so we have a vision, and it kind of sounds like this. We are a church that the unchurched love to experience. And if you, we have a mission, and it's following Jesus, changing together. And so I want to encourage you guys to uh, be praying with us. And one of the ways you can do that is through the prayer request link that is found uh, in the Facebook live feed there uh, below it in the comments. Um, if you have prayer requests, please fill it out. Uh, that's how we can pray together and be a church that does that. I know in this time when things are uncertain, uh, we don't know if we're opening, if we're closing, if whatever we're doing. Uh, prayer is so important, and God has not given up on us. Uh, he wants to be part of our lives and our conversations. Um, also, we always have um, online family content going on during this uh, season of stay at home, and so be checking that out. That's a great way to connect with your family um, and um, get plugged in, use the resources there uh, to teach your, your kids um, and grow as a family in the Lord. Um, also, everyone in Normally gets a connection card, but now it's digital. So the digital connection card uh, is found in the link. If you have any comments, concerns, maybe you're tuning in for the first time. We want to let it, we want to know about that, um, or maybe you decide to follow Jesus today. Maybe uh, you decide to take that next step in your faith. Uh, we want to know about that. Uh, so please fill out that connection card. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Right now, we're going to have a time of offering. This is part of our worship service. It's, it's how we give back to God what is already His so that He can do things for His glory. And that is our prayer with, with, this, with this form of worship is that He'll do amazing things for His glory. There are three ways to give. You can give by the website. Uh, you can give on through our app, uh, which is super easy. Or you can just mail it in. Our address is there. Uh, but we, we want to thank you for continuing to support this ministry. Uh, you've been very faithful with that. And we pray that you'll continue to do that as God lays it on your heart. Uh, I'm going to pray for our offering right now. Lord, I just lift up our offering, uh, that this is something that's from our heart, that we can do cheerfully, even in a time of need. God, you're gonna, you, there's so many needs that we can meet, and your glory can be seen. And I pray that these funds will allow that to happen. I also pray for Pastor Allen as he comes and, and shares a message about family today, and that it sinks into our heart, and God, your word changes our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Allen. We're glad that you're joining us on this Mother's Day. And a quick word to mothers. I shared this on uh, Friday morning. Uh, I'm sure, hopefully, you're celebrating your mom today. But we ought to do that all the time. And I think the easiest way to do that is just to be a little more thankful, at least express that. Thank you, Mom, for fixing breakfast or lunch or dinner or washing my clothes or cleaning my house or whatever it is. And if you're if you're an adult, thank you for your mom when she thank her for doing those things when you're growing up. On the other hand, moms, uh, especially, I think I encourage you to enjoy the journey. It's so easy to say, well, I, I can't wait till I get through this stage with my kids. Just enjoy the journey wherever it might be. And I know this is difficult for some folks because this may be their uh, first year without your mom. Uh, I know for some folks, desire to be a mom, and another year has gone by without that, that joy. And so, uh, let's just pray and support. We all had a mom. Uh, none of them were perfect, <laughs> uh, but we thank you for the moms that, that God gave us. 
And a quick word to our supporters, our attenders, people who support our, our ministry. I, I wanted to bring you an update, financial update. Um, some churches are really struggling this way financially. Uh, but I just want to say in, in the months of March and April, <laughs> praise God, we have operated in the black. We have not uh, laid anybody off. We've not even taken pay cuts. And we didn't follow through of applying from the loan from the government. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your belief in first God and, and of course, this ministry and the financial support. So today, being most of the time between Mother's Day and Father's Day, we like to do a series about family. So we're starting a new series. <clears throat> and we're titling Ideal Family. And this first, first message, first teaching is going to be called Ideally Speaking, because we're going to talk about the ideal this morning, and then we're going to get into some details uh, in coming weeks. Uh, one thing I got to thinking about was, <clears throat> with all the change that's happened over the last seven or eight weeks, especially <laughs> families being together more and homeschooling, all that, Change brings stress. So our families have more stress on them now probably than ever. So hopefully these, these teachings, these messages will be helpful and encouraging to you, uh, whether you're a Jesus follower or not. Uh, these principles will be helpful in, in your family situation. And uh, we all have families. We're all part of families in some way or another. And hopefully we're going to have some fun with this series and learn a lot and uh, make our families uh, healthier, that's a better, good word, healthier. So this is going to be an introduction. We're going to look quickly at some things the Bible says about, uh, about family and, and uh, kind of a basic principle about the ideal, how to approach the ideal. Next week, we're going to give you a question that will be helpful in any relationship, whether Jesus follower or not, uh, it'll help any relationship. One week, we're going to talk about conflict. Another week, we're going to talk about... Um, uh, your legacy, and so uh, we're going to do this for four or five, six weeks. We all have different experiences. We all came from different families. Uh, we have diverse experiences. You might have grown up in a, um, a single fam uh, mom home or single dad. Um, you may have grew, grew up in a traditional home. Uh, your parents may have gotten divorced. You might have been in a blended family, or you may be in a blended family now. Um, so we all have diverse experiences. So thinking about that, I want to think of, share about two things that I think we all have in common. The first one's this. We didn't get to choose our family of origin. I didn't get to choose my mom and dad. You didn't get to choose your mom and dad. None of us got to choose them. Now, those of us that are Jesus followers believe that God placed us in those families that, that we were in. Uh, but an interesting thing I got thinking about when I was probably a young teenager, and maybe you had the same experience, most probably did, um, we thought our friend's family was better than ours. <laughs> and let me share quickly about my friend. My best friend was named Randy, he lived a couple doors down. He actually lived on the other side of the power lines, which we used to uh, play <laughs> often underneath. And uh, he was the oldest, and I'm the oldest, but I'm the oldest of five, and he was the oldest of two. <laughs> He had one brother. I have two brothers and two sisters. His dad was a policeman. I thought that was cool. And they just seemed to do cooler thing. My family just went visit relatives every once in a while. We, their family would go on trips. Actually, I got to go with one, on one with them. And I got to thinking this week, the place we went, we lived in Glen Burnie, the place we went was Cunningham Falls, which is close to here. But that my first experience in Western Maryland was with this family. And so they seemed to have nicer stuff, they had better food, et cetera. So sometime this week I'm going to try and get in touch with Randy and, and have him give me the real story on his family growing up. But why? Why would I think the other, my, Randy's family is better than mine? Why? Because family's emotional. And I can't use the term father without it being emotional to you and myself. Some good sides, some bad sides of my dad. I can't use the word term mother without it being very emotional to me. Lost my mom about 12 years ago, and um, obviously I'm mindful of that, especially on Mother's Day. When you say brother or sister, that becomes emotional. And when you say children, uh, that becomes emotional. 
but we didn't get to choose our family of origin. The second thing, you might think it's a little strange that we all have in common, is <laughs> no one you're related to is as smart as you. Now, let me explain a little bit. Back probably when you were a teenager, right? Your parents would say, you, you shouldn't do that, that's not good. And you say, no, I'm smarter than you, I should do that. And then you went and did it, right? <laughs> or, or they said, you should do this. You said, no, 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 I'm smarter than you, I'm not going to do that. So there's a period in our lives, a stage in our lives, hopefully you've gotten through that stage, uh, where you think you're the smarter, smarter than all your relatives. And then you get to be a, uh, get married, some of us got married, and you think, well, marriage shouldn't be that hard, and then you find out, eh, it really is a little difficult. And then parenting, we think, uh, I can figure this one out. And you can't be a parent for very long before you figure out what? I don't know what I'm doing, right? So we kind of flip from knowing we're the, thinking we're the smartest to thinking we don't know much of anything. So what about the Bible? The Bible ought to give us lots of good examples of family, right? Well, no. <laughs> Is really odd, but if you look at families in the Bible, most of them are really dysfunctional. And these are even the men of faith that we look up to. And you would think, well, Jesus must have had a really good family. And then you read this story when he's like 12 years old, his family leaves him in the t for days. They, they don't even know where he is. They left him back at the temple. How do I come back and get him? Um, we can go all the way back to the beginning, Adam and Eve. <laughs> they were created perfect. They were placed in a perfect environment. Most experts think that didn't last very long. And what happened? Well, man chose woman over God. And someone has, has written this once, and man have been doing that ever since. And then they have two children, two sons. And guess what happens? The one son kills another son. So that's how the Bible narrative starts off with family. And you can skip forward to Abraham. He had a dysfunctional family. Moses. Um, David, we all look up to David. What happened with David's family? Well, one of his sons causes a civil war and rebels against his father. So there's just not a lot of good examples, and especially the Old Testament. The Old the New Testament, we don't have a lot of uh, biographies of, of, of people. We have the words of Jesus, and then we have the applica application by the other writers, Paul and Peter, etc. Now, that's what we want to look at this morning. Uh, some of those things that was written. And the interesting thing is that we need to keep in mind is the cultural difference. This was first century. Even in Jewish culture, women and children had very little value. They were almost treated as property. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And especially in the Greek and, and Roman cultures, um, no, no consideration at all. Uh, women had no rights. Um, children often weren't even named until they survived long enough. And so women and children suffered under first, first century cultures. And even today, where cultures don't embrace the teachings of, uh, of Scripture, uh, women and children suffer the most. So we're going to well, before we get there, let me read a verse about Jesus that it doesn't seem radical to us, but was radical in his day. And this is in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And the, in that audience, the people would have responded, what? Children don't have any value? What, why are you even bringing them up? Why would they even waste our time? Yet Jesus gave them value. He said, let them come to me. They have value. And the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like children. Uh, are you saying, Jesus, that children and women are equal to uh, us men? And Jesus would say, yes. And we often say it this way. The, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. It doesn't matter age or sex or ethnicity or whatever, God sees everyone the same. And so most of what we're going to look at is going to be things that Paul wrote. Now, Paul lived after Jesus, and he knew about the teachings of Jesus, and he's making these, at the time, radical um, instructions to families 
in that culture that would have been very uh, upsetting, disturbing uh, uh, to everyone except for women and children because they were given a value that they didn't have before. So quickly we'll go through some of these verses and kind of summarize what the Bible says about family. <clears throat> First verse is in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, yeah, chapter 6, verse 3. Oh, I, verse, excuse me. <laughs> we didn't do verse for 1 and 2. <laughs> I skipped those. Sorry. Can we go back? All right. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do, the wise thing to do. Honor your father and mother. That's one of the Ten Commandments. And interestingly enough, it says this is the first commandment with a promise. So what's the promise? If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. Easier at home, right? And you'll have a long life on earth. I, I had I almost laughed. I said, well, at least you survived childhood, right? <laughs> if, you, if you obey your parents and, and honor them. So that's addressed to children. Uh, next, we'll address wives in Colossians. Wives, submit to your husbands. And that's kind of a, a buzzword, that word submit. So hold on. <laughs> As is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. So I'm going to use some other translations to kind of fill in some of these words. Uh, let every wife be supportive and tenderly devoted to her husband. Does that sound a little bit better? My wife liked that better. Uh, for this is a beautiful illustration of our devotion to Christ. So, be supportive and ten tenderly devoted to your husband. Now, most of the people, who do you think brings that ver verse up to me the most? It's men. Now, who's the verse addressed to? Men, you can, I've said this before, men, you can cut that verse out of your Bible. It's not addressed to you. And consequently, this next verse, guess who brings it up the most to me? It's not husbands, even though it's addressed to husbands. In fact, my wife <laughs> shares this verse with me occasionally. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Another translation, let every husband be filled with cherishing love for his wife and my wife really liked this, this, this <laughs> terminology. Never be insensitive toward her. Now, why would Paul say, don't be harsh to your wives? Because men were harsh to women in that culture. They were harsh to their animals. They were harsh to their children. They were just harsh, especially in the Greek and Roman cultures. And so, Paul is saying, if I make the application of Jesus' teaching to family, husbands, don't do that. Don't, don't be harsh. Now, addressing fathers. Uh, scriptures don't address mothers particularly, and of course in that culture fathers were in control. So we could say parents, but it says fathers. Don't aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Another translation, fathers don't have unrealistic expectations for your children or else they may become discouraged. And Having been, I am a parent, but having raised children, my thinking is they aggravate me, <laughs> they exasperate me. But the scripture says, no, 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 <laughs> you're the adult, don't let your, don't aggravate your children. And as a, as a parent, I didn't do it intentionally. I wanted to discipline them, I wanted them to grow up and mature, uh, but I often, I'm sure, exasperated them. It's probably the instruction about family that I, that I violated the most in my lifetime. Another illustration of this is the term a weight. Don't put an excess weight on your children. And especially, and, and, and moms, I think you'll agree with this, a father's words have more weight than a woman's words. You know, you would say it once, twice, three or four times, and then the dad says it, and for some reason the, the, the child seems to hear it. And so, a father's words seem to have more weight. And so, fathers, we need to especially be careful of our words. And we've all hurt our kids with our words. We've uh, discouraged them. I like what James Dobson taught years ago. As a parent, my, my job is to break my child's will. They have a, a sinful, disobedient will, but not to crush their spirits. And that's the the balance you have to keep to uh, break their will without crushing their spirits. 
And then one other verse about uh, address to husbands. In the same way, husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you physically, obviously, not other, other respects. But she is your equal partner. Now, that was radical, even in Jewish culture, much less in Roman and Greek culture. She is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. She has equal access to God. She has equal access to, to salvation, eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, another term a translation uses is that husbands have uh, intimate insight into your wives. I think that was really good. The longer I've gotten to know my wife, the more I understand her, have insight to her. And another term it uses is be considerate of what she delights in. And that's something I've really tried to work on in recent years is not to stifle what my wife delights in, uh, whether it's uh, gift giving, she's, she's a giver, and so uh, I try not to do that. And husbands, as you're listening to this, and especially in that first century culture, they say, what about me? <laughs> you know, my parents picked this lady out for me. Why, <laughs> why should I treat her so nicely? So summarizing really quickly. Here's what the Bible has to say <laughs> to families. Husbands, love your wives. Love them all the time. Love them unconditionally. Uh, treat them, honor them, respect them, etc., etc. Wives, submit to your husbands. We, we explain that. We'll talk about that more next week. Uh, children, obey your parents. That's kind of a no-brainer. And then fathers, or parents in general, don't aggravate your children. Now, that just seems like common sense in our culture, but again, this was radical in the first century. Uh, people didn't live this way. Families weren't structured this way. Now, we're talking about ideal family. This is ideal family, obviously. Do husbands always love their wives? No. Two wives always submit to their husbands? No. My wife does, but no. Yeah, no. Anyway, uh, children obey your parents. Oh, kids all, yeah, my kids always obeyed me. Yeah, not, never seen that. And fathers don't aggravate your children. So that's the ideal. None of us have done that. So how do we deal with that? It's, it's frustrating. There's that, uh, I have guilt about falling short in these different areas. Well, here's the interesting thing. And uh, next slide, please. Jesus pointed to an ideal, yet refused to condemn those who fell short. So the ideal is for me to unconditionally love my wife. Do I do that? No. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't condemn me for that. In fact, Jesus did this. He raise the standard so the standard got higher harder to reach but the grace got deeper I'll give you a, an illustration <clears throat> one of the ten commandments says don't commit adultery and uh, you know hopefully many of us men say glad I didn't I, you know I haven't been unfaithful to my wife I haven't slept with another woman but Jesus comes along and says what uh, that's not the meaning the true meaning is this don't even lust after another woman. So automatically, probably every man I know has committed adultery and probably half the women. And so Jesus raises the standard. Are we just supposed to feel horrible about that? No, the grace goes deeper. Even though I've committed adultery, lusted in my heart, God has forgiven me. There's an a, a expression, a phrase in Scripture goes this way. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And we've talked about this before. We sometimes think that you have to have a balance. So I, I, I'm 50% grace and 50% truth, or maybe I'm 70% grace and 30% truth. <laughs> but when you think about, wait a minute, wait a minute, I can't be 50% truth. You know, I have truth half the time and truth not half the time. But we don't seem like we, we can have both. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He was 100% truth. He never compromised truth, but he never compromised full grace and mercy. So, are we going to adopt, stress, follow 
the ideal, the truth, or are we going to settle for less? And the reason we would settle for less is to make us feel better. I don't feel so guilty. I don't feel like I've fallen short so much. And again, I understand this is really emotional. It's emotional for me. So another way of saying this is saying this is that Jesus was comfortable with this tension. I don't think we are, <laughs> or it's hard for us, but Jesus was comfortable with the tension. Strive for the ideal, don't give up on the ideal, but there's forgiveness, there's grace, because you're not going to reach it. I'm going to use another illustration um, where Jesus elaborates on this, on this principle. It's in Matthew chapter 19, uh, beginning in verse 3. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. They did this repeatedly. Um, they didn't like the fact that he was teaching things, Jesus was teaching things that they didn't agree with. And so, th- they would ask him questions that was kind of like a lose-lose. If he says this, he's going to lose. If he says this, he's going to lose. <laughs> and of course, Jesus didn't. He would come up with some answer that they didn't think of. So, here's the, here's the question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now, this was in Jewish law. Ladies, unfortunately, that was it. We have no fault divorce now. It was nothing like Judaism. In Judaism in the first century, all a man had to do was say to his wife, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And he was divorced. She was divorced. She was put out. She had no legal standing. He didn't have to go to court. He didn't have to get any papers, anything. That's all he had to do. And it seemed to be backed up by, um, they're going to call it, uh, the law of Moses. <laughs> and then Jesus' reply is, haven't you read the Scripture? Which would have been an insult to them. They spent their lives studying Scripture. They recorded the Scriptures that from the beginning, again, the ideal, God made them male and female. And he goes on. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother, is joined to his wife, and the two are united. Uh, Some translations cling to his wife. United into one, since they are no longer two, (laughs) but one, let no one, kind of a play on words, split apart what God has joined together. So that was the intention. That was the ideal. You get married once and for all. Uh, I came across this term. I thought it was kind of interesting. Don't unone, made up word, don't unone <laughs> what God made one. And that's what divorce does. It takes something that is one and, and, and divides it, splits it up. Now, I understand the real is this happens. There are abusive situations. There are the need for some uh, couples uh, to divorce. So then Jesus goes on and says this. Then why, or they asked Jesus, why then did Moses say the law, in the law, that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? And Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce. He allowed it only as a concession to your hard hearts. But, remember we always say the buts are important. It was not what God originally intended. So, that's the ideal. But mankind has fallen, they're sinful, we are flawed. And I think as Rick Warren says, uh, (laughs) marriage is is a combination of two sinners. And so you're going to have problems. And so, by concession, divorce was allowed. And their response might be, well, Jesus, what are you going to do about this? And my imaginary response for Jesus would be this. I'm not going to do anything to them. They've sinned. They've broken the law. I'm going to do something for them. So since they have sinned, we use the word sin, I'm going to die to save them from their sin. 
so they could have forgiveness. So you see the tension here? Jesus was really comfortable with it. <laughs> we're not. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, we're glad that you're tuning in and we're glad that you're listening. And we want you to know it's okay. <laughs> All of us were at that state sometime. And you have a good reason. Believing what you believe or not believing in what you believe. So, take the words of Jesus and use them best, uh, as best you can. But most of us watching or listening, including myself, are Jesus followers. So the question is, are we going to embrace the ideal? Are we going to redefine it? <laughs> are we going to change the meaning? Are we going to lower the bar? So let me ask you a really important question. Does God give us permission to do that? What do you think? I don't think so. In fact, I can't find it in there anywhere. It said Jesus was perfectly fine with the tension. And it makes us uncomfortable. In fact, if you've been divorced, if I talked about and used this passage of Scripture, you probably are feeling uncomfortable. And again, there, there's some good causes. Maybe yours was a good cause. Maybe you didn't, you know, your, your spouse just left you. You didn't have any any say. But here's kind of a proof, I think, that we truly believe in the ideal. I've never performed a marriage ceremony where the couple said, oh, we're going to get divorced in a few years. <laughs> I've never met a parent that says, hey, I hope my, parent, my children get divorced someday. I've never met a single parent that desires that their grandkids grow up in a single parent home. We all want the ideal that, the, that, that Jesus and the scriptures point to. But we all fail. So there's the ideal, and then there's grace, and there's mercy. So let me end with this. If we resolve the tension, if we lower the bar so the tension's not there, then we feel comfortable. We lose something incredibly important. So here's my in, uh, feelings on the subject, my, my viewpoint. Therefore, we shouldn't resolve this tension or strive to resolve this tension. Because our families depend on it for their future success. If you want your family to be the best family it can be, the best marriage, the healthiest family, the best uh, parent-child relationships, don't lower the bar. Strive for the ideal. And then accept God's forgiveness when you fall short. Forgive yourself. Hopefully forgive those in your family that have fallen short. Can't, we shouldn't seek to resolve the tension, to remove the tension, just so we, I guess, temporarily feel better about ourselves as parents or spouses or children to our families. So, try and leave you a think about, hopefully, you think about some of these things past when, I, when we close our service time. So, here's my think about, we just talked about. Are you continuing to strive for the ideal? Evaluate your family. Evaluate your relationship. Evaluate your husband-wife relationship. Evaluate your parent-child relationship. Children, evaluate your children-parent relationship. Evaluate those. So what are you doing? And I, I know the tendency is to let some of these ideals slide just because it's hard. And uh, we feel bad because we don't reach those. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. <laughs> the healthiest thing, the best thing is to keep the ideal, keep striving to reach it, but accepting God and, and others and your own forgiveness when you fall short. So my encouragement to you, don't settle for less. Let me pray with you. Ah, Father God, we read those ideals and we... 
and we either want to <laughs> lower them or just, ah, they're not impossible, so hey, I'll just do the best I can or, or try and change the definition of the terms. <laughs> um, and they might temporarily make us or help us feel better, but it doesn't make the family better. It doesn't make the relationships better. So, God, I would, I would pray that each of us would make a new commitment, a recommitment to say, yes, I'm going to strive for the ideal. I'm going to strive to love my wife 100% of the time unconditionally. Wives, that word submit basically loves, it means love also. Uh, I'm going to 100% love my husband, whether he deserves it or not, because we don't always deserve it, uh, and forgive him. Fathers in particular, be careful with your words. Uh, apologize when you fall short. Uh, Work diligently not to crush your children's spirits, not to discourage them. And children, it's pretty cool. You get this promise <laughs> that your life will go well. Things will be easier for you if you obey your parents. And they're the, it's the wise thing to do. But God, we know that uh, there is no perfect families. There are healthy families, and God, that's my prayer for each family listening. And some of my under some folks, I live alone, and I understand they're single families, uh, but they have relationships, maybe with siblings or others. That would that, that would that, that that these families would be healthy, and by healthy we mean they would continue to strive for the ideal and accept your forgiveness when they fall short. And for anyone that's not a Jesus follower, you've been listening this morning, we would encourage you to make, make that step, take that step, step across that line, receive God's forgiveness, uh, whatever your family situation is. Uh, you're not perfect, your family's not perfect, and you're dealing with that imperfection, you're dealing with it, struggling with that, uh, forgiving others, forgiving yourself. My prayer would be you accept, first and foremost, God's forgiveness. It makes it so much easier. <laughs> to forget, accept others' forgiveness. Uh, God, we thank you that you've been present in this time with us. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So glad you joined us. Uh, excited about this series. Again, next week especially, tune in, believer or unbeliever. The question is going to be helpful in all your relationships. Thank you.